This is Order, an important Senator time Wish Wilson, for Australians to get the PM. Back. We'll move to questions. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Is the Minister aware that today the New South Wales Health Minister Brad Hazard confirmed the gap between the first and second doses of Pfizer vaccine in Sydney will be spaced out to eight weeks? Mr. Hazard said, and I quote, simply put, there is not enough Pfizer in New South Wales or anywhere in the two major states, New South Wales or Victoria, for the people who are now wanting it. Will the Minister acknowledge today's announcement is not enough to fix this. The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank Senator Keneally Order. for her question, uh, Mr. President. Yes, and I did see the uh, media conference where Minister Hazard indicated that uh, the spacing Order. for Pfizer vaccines in New South Wales had been spaced out to eight weeks. I understand, Mr. President, that in Victoria it's actually at a six-week interval. Um, in other jurisdictions, uh, they have varying uh, order. They Senator have, they have varying uh, intervals between the doses based on the health advice, Mr. Senator President. Watt. Uh, and we have continued um, uh, to put additional capacity where we can uh, into jurisdictions. In fact. Uh, only recently we announced that we had available to Australia, through a deal with Poland, one million additional Pfizer doses, Mr President, and we put half of those into New South Wales with the acknowledgement of the circumstances that New South Wales was seeing with the current outbreak, Mr President. And today, uh, very pleasingly, an additional half a million doses coming from Singapore, Mr President, will also assist uh, with, the, with the circumstances nationally with the vaccine rollout. And as the Prime Minister has said, we continue, we continue to work on the availability of vaccines to assist the vaccine rollout, Mr President. We've been very transparent with the Australian people. We have published the Order. supply projections for vaccines out to the end of the year, that, Mr President. That information was provided to the Chamber. Order. That, was, that information was provided out to the uh, uh, to the chamber uh, some months ago, Mr. President, uh, and we continue to be transparent. There are there are significant supplies right now of AstraZeneca available. There are no constraints with respect to the supply of AstraZeneca, Mr. President. And so I would encourage anyone who wants a vaccine to make inquiries about getting one. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Morrison. Announced all aged care workers would have at least one COVID dose by 17 September. But today, New South Wales Health Minister Brad Hazard said he is, quote, not at all confident that will happen. Will the Morrison-Joyce government ensure all aged care workers receive a vaccine by 17 September to protect them and the people in their care? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I don't agree with Mr. Minister Hazard with respect to his perspective on uh, the vaccination of the aged care workforce. As of yesterday, there were about 58,000 workers, aged care workers in Australia yet to be vaccinated. Last week, Mr. President, we vaccinated over 22,000 of them. We've been, we've been vaccinating about 20 odd, 20 -odd thousand uh, a week. Um, we offered uh, last week uh, 35,000 opportunities. We'll op offer this week 28,000 opportunities for aged care workers through our range of programs, specific aged care uh, opportunities for vaccination, Mr. President. So uh, we're working extremely hard with the providers, uh, with the union movement, in fact, Mr. President, who uh, my department meet with twice a week. I meet with uh, every Friday to discuss the rollout and the issues relating to the aged care uh, workforce rollout. So we are determined, Mr. President to get the aged care workforce vaccinated. Uh, we are at... Uh, Order. Senator Colbeck. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. When Mr Morrison's own New South Wales Liberal and National colleagues have today continued to lay the blame for the bungled vaccine rollout squarely at his feet, how can Australians languishing in lockdown possibly believe Mr Morrison when he says he's fixed the failures of his bungled vaccine rollout? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr President, I simply don't accept the characterisation that Senator Keneally uh, has put on her question, Mr President. 
Uh, we are currently running uh, vaccination rates on a per capita basis uh, that are as good or better than any place in the world, the UK, the US, Mr President. So yes, we did have some problems with the vaccination rollout early. We've acknowledged that, Mr President. We have been straight with the Australian people. We haven't been trying to undermine public confidence in the Order. vaccine rollout like Labor have. We've, we've continued to work, Mr President. We have continued Order. to work to support supply Order. of vaccine for the Australian Senator people, Mr Keneally. President. Uh, we've, we've done deals where we could to gain access to additional capacity, and we've provided that information to the Australian people. And Mr. Pre Mr. President, it's clear to the Australian people, even if it's not clear to the Australian Labor Party. Uh, vaccination is important. Take the opportunity to go and get a vaccine. The best vaccine is the one that's available to you right now. Order. Order. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister update the Senate on the ways in which our diplomatic capability is delivering to protect Australians? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Smith uh, very much for the question. Mr President, uh, as announced uh, today by the Prime Minister, uh, particularly in relation to Singapore, through our diplomatic channels with Singapore and previously with Poland, the government uh, has been able to secure access to 1.5 million vaccine doses this month. Earlier today, the Prime Minister, the Health Minister and I announced that Australia will receive 500,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine from Singapore under a dose-sharing arrangement. We will in turn deliver 500,000 Pfizer doses to Singapore in December uh, when those supplies are available. It is a constructive and flexible way for governments to work together in all of our interests to manage COVID-19. And I particularly want to thank Prime Minister Lee, Foreign Minister Vivian Balakrishnan and the people of Singapore and acknowledge the work of Australia's High Commissioner, Will Hodgman, and his team, who have worked closely with the Government of Singapore to achieve this outcome. Mr President, earlier this month we announced our agreement to receive one million Pfizer vaccines from Poland. Uh, these additional doses came uh, on top of the 40 million Pfizer doses that Australia has secured for 2021, and that does provide a boost to the vaccine rollout across the country. It does also demonstrate the value of Australia's close engagement with other governments, and it's a strong example of countries cooperating and supporting one another as we face the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic together and across the Indo-Pacific in particular. It also reinforces uh, the role that my department, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, plays in supporting Australia's response to and recovery from COVID-19. We are cooperating with our partners in the region, Mr President, cooperating to save lives, to advance economic recovery and to build health systems to protect against future pandemics. Senator Smith, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline the work we are doing to support vaccine access and COVID-19 support in the Pacific and in Southeast Asia? Senator Payne. Uh, thanks very much, Mr President. And again, I thank Senator Smith for his question. Uh, at the G7 in June, uh, Prime Minister Morrison committed to the delivery of at least 20 million vaccine doses from Australia's domestic, domestic supply to our region by uh, mid-2022. We have already delivered over 2.1 million vaccine doses to the Pacific and Southeast Asia, as well as that vital end-to-end -end support for those doses to be administered where they are needed most. The delivery of 403,000 doses to Vietnam last week was the first of a number to our Southeast Asian partners. We've also committed 2.5 million doses to our partners in Indonesia and we'll begin delivery of those uh, soon. We're working in partnership with our neighbours to support comprehensive vaccination of the Pacific and Timor-Leste, Mr President. At this point in time, we've delivered 861,000 vaccine doses to Fiji. 577,850 to Timor-Leste, as I said, 403,000 to Vietnam, and further doses, of course, to Papua New Guinea, Order. the Solomon Senator Islands, Payne. Samoa, Tonga, Time Tuvalu, Vanuatu. Has expired. And Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate of our cooperation with international partners in support of vaccine <coughs> access across our region? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. We are working closely with international partners to support the region's response and recovery to the COVID-19 pandemic and to ensure access to COVID-19 vaccines for our partners. The impacts of COVID-19 continue to be very significant. The da damage to economies and to communities in our region is severe. We've committed $130 million to the COVAX AMC, which has been delivering vaccines to the region since February. 
Our neighbours in Southeast Asia and the Pacific have now received more than 48 million COVAX doses, with more deliveries planned. And in addition, Australia has contributed $100 million to the Quad Vaccine Partnership. That's directed to vaccine procurement for the region and support for national vaccine rollouts. We are working with our partners to support these countries within their national plans on uh, their priorities and delivering uh, in those uh, partnerships in that manner. Senator Sheldon. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Today, 1,164 new local COVID-19 cases have been recorded in New South Wales, with 143 people currently in an ICU and, tragically, 96 total deaths during the current outbreak. An experienced respiratory physician at a Western Sydney hospital has described the COVID-19 crisis in Western Sydney in the following words. I quote, imagine if during last year's bushfire, bushfires, brigade captains were not informed where fires were moving and what resources might be required. This is exactly what is happening now. Spot fires have turned into roaring blazes of the virus. Is he right? So could you say the last phrase again, Senator Sheldon, um, after the quotation? Uh, we didn't quite hear. Uh, is he right? No, thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I think, I think it's, it's disappointing that Senator Sheldon would seek to make such a direct comparison between the circumstances of the very tragic bushfires last year and the circumstances Order. of the uh, pandemic right now, Mr. President. Clearly in New South Wales, uh, it's clearly in New South Wales, the situation is extremely difficult. Uh, the New South Wales government has placed uh, significant lockdowns on large proportions of the uh, New South Wales community, uh, Mr. President, and, um, uh, and of course across all of New South Wales in an attempt to manage the current outbreak and suppress the spread of the virus, Mr. President. And suppression of the spread of the virus has been part of the national strategy on COVID-19 right since the outset of the pandemic. In, Mr. In, um, uh, in 2020, Mr. President. Uh, we value the contributions of all medical providers in relation to the management of the outbreak. And uh, at all times, Mr. President, both at a state level and at a national level, uh, we have relied significantly on the medical advice uh, from our health professionals at a national level in guiding and establishing the national plan for COVID-19. And we know that in, in the states and territories, uh, the Chief health officers have played an absolutely pivotal role in the management and the advice to the, to the states and territories with respect to the management of the virus. And, and I am certain uh, that they will continue to do that. They provide very valuable information and advice in, with respect to the management of the, uh, the, the pandemic, Mr President. Uh, and of course, through National Cabinet, the states and the territories are working together uh, with respect to the management of the virus uh, and the pandemic across the country, Mr. President, and we'll continue to do that. Take the advice that's being provided to us by the professionals that are leading the pandemic uh, and continue to work with them on managing the particular outbreaks in Order, all of the Senator jurisdictions. Colbeck. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. It has been reported that the Morrison Joyce government is only now seeking urgent advice from intensive care doctors about the pressure on hospital wards. Despite being more than 18 months into the pandemic, why has the Morrison Joyce government waited for a living crisis to seek advice? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I completely reject uh, the, the insinuation of, uh, of, of, uh, of Senator Sheldon, Mr. President. In fact, uh, in March last year, Mr. President, in March last year, we established a national agreement with the public health, uh, with private hospital, the private hospital sector that provided us with the capacity to supplement public health uh, capacity across the country. And Mr. President, and as the circumstances of each of the outbreaks have come into place, those measures have been put into place, Mr. President. They were in Victoria last year, Mr. President, and they ha can be and they will be in New South Wales, Mr. President. 
So one of the very first things, Mr. President, one of the very first things that this government did was to ensure the hospital capacity available to treat Australians who were suffering with COVID-19, Mr. President. So for Labor to be just coming on board now, it's a bit late to come to the game, Mr. President. Order, Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. The Western Sydney doctor also warned, and I quote, with the coming deluge of cases, it is possible ambulances will not reach people suffering from heart attacks or strokes as quickly as they should. Can the minister guarantee that ambulances across Australia will be properly resourced to cope with the increased demand of high COVID-19 case numbers in the coming months? Senator Colbeck. Well, thank you, Mr President. Can I at first pay tribute to all of those uh, paramedics, ambulance workers across the country who are doing such a great job. And, and I am happy to concede, Mr President, uh, at the current time, particularly in New South Wales, under severe pressure, under severe pressure, uh, because there, are, there, there, there is a significant uh, transmission of COVID-19 in the community at the moment, Mr President, uh, and, and I know that they are working very hard and very diligently to meet the demand, Mr President. Uh, Mr. President. So we have put additional resources, significant additional resources, into the national health system uh, across the country, uh, particularly focused on uh, COVID-19. In fact, on the 13th of March last year, 13th of March 2020, the, the Australian government and all state and territory governments signed a national partnership to respond to the, the virus, uh, Mr. President. So we have been working on this and ensuring the capacity was there for a long time, Mr. President. Order. Order. Senator Thorpe remotely. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the minister representing the Prime Minister. A First Nations man died because of COVID-19 this week. Our communities are not getting the help they so urgently need as COVID rips through our communities. Will Kenya Mob ask for urgent help over a year ago? Why did you neglect our people and our calls for support? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir, Mr. President. I thank Senator Thorpe for her question and look, acknowledge that uh, every uh, loss of life through, uh, through this pandemic is a tragic one. Uh, it's tragic around the world uh, where, Mr. President, uh, we've seen more than four and a half million deaths across the globe. Uh, and of course, it's tragic in Australia where some 1,006 deaths have occurred. Uh, and whilst the death rate in Australia has been far, far lower than around the world, we acknowledge the personal pain and anguish of those individuals. Uh, if we compare uh, the situation through Australia during this pandemic, in Victoria last year, when we didn't have the targeted aspects of the vaccine rollout in place, uh, there was a fatality rate of around 4.2%. This year, during the outbreak that's occurring in New South Wales, that fatality rate has dropped by close to 90% and down to 0.45%. Uh, that's a large factor due to the heavy focus on ensuring that older Australians were vaccinated first and foremost, uh, and in doing so, uh, helping to make sure that we reduce the fatality rate in those most vulnerable uh, populations of all older Australians. Uh, I acknowledge that, uh, that we do have particular challenges in Western New South Wales and around the Wilcannia uh, region, as Senator Thorpe... Can I point sorry, of order? No, sorry, Senator Thorpe, the remote participation rules don't allow for points of order when participating remotely. Well, how can I get the um, question out? You've got a... Um, someone in the chamber can raise something or you've got supplementary questions, my apologies, uh, but they are the rules the Senate adopted. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, so in relation to those around Western New South Wales, in particular the Wilcannia region, we've been working closely with state and territory governments and Aboriginal controlled and community health services to ensure the needs of Indigenous community planning and delivery, including through uh, this outbreak of COVID, and particularly as it relates to working through uh, the vaccination program. Uh, indeed, Mr. President, uh, we know that there are particular challenges in there, uh, and it is in response to those challenges uh, that we have ensured additional resources 
have been provided to rural Kenya to help to support that community and those across Western New South Wales. The Commonwealth Department of Health stood up an incident management team to coordinate the Commonwealth response. Order. Senator Looking Birmingham, the time for the Anime answer has expired. Senator Thorpe, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The gap between First Nations vaccination rates and non-Indigenous rates is as high as 17 percentage points in some states. When will all First Nations people be vaccinated? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, I, uh, I continue to urge and encourage all Australians, including Indigenous Australians, Torres Strait Islanders, uh, indeed, all parts of our population, uh, to respond and to seize the earliest opportunities to be vaccinated. And we're seeing amazing growth in Australia in the vaccine program. Uh, and that growth indeed has seen uh, from four weeks ago, uh, when 42% of the population uh, had had a first dose, uh, to now nearly 59% of the Australian population having had oh, so on, a on a first point of dose. Order. Sorry, Senator we Birmingham, I have Senator Hanson Young on a point of order. You Senator Hanson Young. On a point of order, um, Senator Thorpe asked specifically about Indigenous peoples, and I'd like the minister to answer that well, question. I, I when would they be that? Senator, um, there was a, a, a statistic asserted, Senator Hanson Young, there was a statistic asserted as a preamble to that. I believe the minister is being directly relevant to that with this part of the answer. I'll continue to listen carefully, but I can't instruct him how to answer the question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. We have more than 9,000 access points uh, for people to get a vaccine across Australia now. That is only going to grow. Uh, we are working uh, across particularly Western and far Western New South Wales uh, with the Royal Flying Doctor Service, uh, with other vaccine providers, with primary health care networks and Aboriginal community controlled health services to make sure uh, that we have an even more points of access for individuals as we're doing across Indigenous communities right around the country. The message must be clear to take advantage of these opportunities Order. to help Senator drive the time for the answer has expired. Higher. Senator Thorpe, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you for your non answer. Minister, people are dying out there and you did not answer my question. Our communities and our people warned you, warned this government about housing, safe decarceration and self-determined health service a year ago. How much blame do you accept for completely failing Aboriginal people in this country without the excuses? Senator do your Birmingham. job. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I don't accept uh, the characterisation by Senator Thorpe in, uh, in her answer. Uh, this is a challenging global pandemic. Uh, as I said, in response to the primary question, more than four and a half million people around the world uh, have lost their lives. And uh, we've sought to provide the best protections possible for Australians from the outset and uh, through the closure of Australia's international borders to the scaling up of a range of different health responses across the country, working closely with those state and territory partners. Uh, and now at this stage, through the vaccine rollout. I'm sorry, vaccine... this is wrong. Order, Senator Thorpe, please. Senator Birmingham to continue. We lost Senator Birmingham. Somebody, do I have any so friends order, in there? Senator Just... Thorpe, order, please. Do black oh, Senator Thorpe, I can ask for your microphone to be muted if you keep interjecting. Senator Birmingham to continue. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, nobody pretends these issues are easy or have easy responses, uh, but indeed ensuring the additional Senator vaccine Seward, on a point of order. So I do you have a point of order. Um, the minister isn't answering, answering the question was, how much do you accept blame for the so, failure sorry, to Senator vaccinate Seward, First Nations? I, so Senator Seward, resume that your seat. The... I have asserted repeatedly that I'm not going to allow points of order on direct relevance for people to simply stand up and ask the question again, or as in this case, part of the question again. There was not even an attempt to make a point of order about direct relevance, Senator Seward. There was a lot in the question asked by Senator Thorpe, and the minister is entitled to respond to any or all parts of it in the time allotted. That part of I the question. Senator Seward, I have said before that I can't instruct a minister which part of a question to answer, which assertion to address, or how to answer a question. 
If there are long questions with a lot of content in them, the minister is entitled to address any or all parts of it in the minute he has allowed in this case. I've ruled repeatedly that tight questions will be, uh, have a very tight test of direct relevance. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr President. As I've said in the Chamber many times, uh, we accept responsibility for the challenges the vaccine rollouts faced and for fixing it. And indeed, we accept responsibility for dealing with all of the different challenges we've faced during COVID-19, because that's the job we have to get on and do. And it's why we've put the RFDS in place with additional vaccine capacity. Order. While we're working Senator with Birmingham, time for the answer has expired. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister update the Senate on Australia's COVID-19 vaccine rollout as part of the national plan agreed by National Cabinet, particularly in relation to older Australians? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and thanks, Senator Brockman, for your question. Mr President, Australia's COVID-19 vaccine rollout continues to ramp, out, ramp up as we said it would. More than 19.3 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines have now been administered in Australia, Mr President. Over the weekend, around 380,000 people rolled up their sleeves and got a jab to protect themselves, their friends, Mr President, uh, their families and to protect their country. Yesterday, a further 277,000 doses went into arms of Australians, Mr. President, and I thank every single one of those people for going out and getting vaccinated and encourage all Australians to do the same. While your home state of Western Australia, Senator Brockman, has uh, very low COVID infections, the vaccine rollout is forging ahead in Western Australia too. So that when the time Order. comes, WA can join Order. all the states Senator Watt. and reopen to the rest of the country and to the world, which is going to be very important for us all, Mr. President. We've got on with the job of protecting our most vulnerable Australians. That's our older citizens first. More than 87% of over 70s are protected with the first dose. We have done this because we know that elimination of the virus is a fallacy and vaccines are the answer to us living with the virus, not in fear of it. We have a national plan that states and territories have agreed on to open up at 70 and 80 per cent vaccination rates progressively. If we don't stick to the plan, the cost in terms of lives and livelihoods, as we're hearing right now, will be unacceptably high. Jobs will be lost, businesses will close. I'm, I'm pleased that you think that's funny, Senator. I really do. I think that's outrageous. The debt burden will rise and the well-being of Australians will suffer. Vaccines, Mr President, are the path to safety and living order. with the virus into the future. Order. Order on my left. Order. Senator McAllister. Senator McAllister. Senator Watt. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I do have a supplementary question. How is the Liberal and National Government strengthening the skilled workforce in aged care to help protect older Australians order. through Sorry, Senator, and Senator beyond? Brockman. I'm going to, Senator Brockman. I have repeatedly asked for silence during questions. If the opposition expects the courtesy, it should give the same to the government and vice versa. Senator Brockman, you can start the question again. I couldn't hear it. Obviously touched a sore point over there, Mr uh, President. Just to the question, how, Senator Brockman. How is the Liberal and Nationals government strengthening the skilled workforce in aged care to help protect older Australians through and beyond the COVID-19 pandemic? Good question. Senator Colbeck. Thank Senator you. Watt, take a breath. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. <laughs> I'm pleased Polly. to report that the vaccination rate of our workforce who care for our most vulnerable Australians is climbing each and every day. And 78 per cent of the aged care workforce in residential care have had at least one dose of the vaccine. National Cabinet agreed that the COVID-19 vaccination of residential workers will become mandatory by mid-September. The Department of Health has been working with each residential aged care facility to ensure they have plans in place and provide support where needed to ensure every residential aged care worker has access to COVID-19 vaccination, Mr President. There are a number of channels open to them to get vaccinated, including the government's inreach services, vaccination of their own staff and using the Commonwealth and state vaccination clinics, GPs and around 3,000 pharmacies across the country, Mr President. We are determined to get this done. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. President. What other measures, including rapid antigen testing, is the government introducing to further protect communities across Australia? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And a very important question, Mr. President. The Australian government is making rapid antigen testing kits available to residential age care, home care services delivered through the Commonwealth Host Home and services delivered through the Commonwealth Home Support Program in high-risk local government areas of concern across Sydney and. Western New South Wales. Rapid antigen testing, Mr President, is not an alternative to vaccination, but it does provide an extra layer of defence Order. in that it helps to detect COVID-19 in people without any symptoms of COVID-19. Applications are open and remain open, Mr President, to receive rapid antigen test kits. To date, orders have been dispatched Order. to 128 sites in Sydney and New South Wales. Kits will be distributed under the national medical stockpile arrangements. Mr. President, the TGA has published guidance, including a checklist to help businesses with the implementation of COVID-19 rapid, rapid antigen point of care testing in their workforce. Order. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Today, there are close to 70 COVID-19 cases in Wilcannia. And tragically, it was reported yesterday that a First Nations man died from COVID-19 in Dubbo. New South Wales Deputy Premier Nationals MP John Barillaro has said today, and I quote, we know that the federal government's vaccination program at the start of the year identified indigenous communities as part of the 1A rollout and it hadn't occurred. And that's something that they lost attention of. And we know earlier in the year, the rollout wasn't anywhere where it needed to be. Why did the Morrison-Joyce government lose attention and fail to ensure these communities were vaccinated as planned many months ago? Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, and can I say um, we all uh, join with um, others in the chamber in respect of the unfortunate passing of the uh, indigenous person in um, in Wilcannia, Order. Mr. President. But can I say, uh, Senator is completely incorrect with respect to characterisation of the work that's been done in that community. Order, and Senator Watt. Oh, sorry, Senator O'Neill. I hope it's a point of order and not attempt to restate the question. Uh, my, your wish is my command, Mr. President. Thank you. So, um, can I just say that no, I don't want to restate the question, but. Uh, what, the the, the minister has the point of order is is really a, that he said work outside the standing orders in terms of attributing to me a quote that well, was Senator, from Senator Minister Barrow. Senator O'Neill, there was no breach of the standing orders. Um, there's a time to debate the answer to questions after question time, where people's satisfaction or otherwise with answers can be attended to then. Senator Colbeck to continue. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, the, the, the government, Commonwealth Government, um, through a GP respiratory led clinic, uh, has had a presence um, through Marae Ma in Wilcannia since May of 2020. Since what, May of 2020, Mr. President. Um, Mar Marae Ma transitioned to become a Commonwealth vaccination clinic, Mr President, on the 22nd of March this year, so very early in the vaccine rollout. Uh, so so, so it, trans Order. it transitioned into uh, a, a vaccination clinic on the 22nd of March, offering AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, and then started administering Pfizer vaccine on the 11th of June, Mr President, so well before. This Order. outbreak occurred, Mr. President. Well, if you're, if, so, Senator, if you are talking down, if you are talking down AstraZeneca, Senator, you Order. ought to be ashamed of yourself, Senator. If you are talking down AstraZeneca, which is what you're doing by your statements, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, Mr. President, because the medical Order. advice, Mr. President, the medical advice Order. is that the best vaccine for you is the one that you can get today, Mr. President, and that vaccine's been available in this community, Mr. Order. President, since March of this Senator year. Since March of this year, in Senator line with our commitment Senator to prioritise Indigenous Senator communities, Mr. President. 
So if, well, sen if, 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 the, if, if the good senator wants to continue to Order, downplay— Order, Senator or Colbeck. Talk time for the answer has expired. Order. At least while I'm calling the chamber to order, can a little respect for the rules be shown? Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Senator Keneally. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Mr Barillaro, and it is Mr Barillaro who said, and I quote, should they have been vaccinated earlier? Yes. It was all part of the federal government's rollout of the vaccination program at the start of the year, and it didn't occur. Why didn't this occur? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, as I've just indicated, Order. Mr. Barillaro, in that context, is completely wrong because there was a there was a Order. there was a, an AstraZeneca clinic out Senator Watt and Will Kenya, Mr. President, out in Will Kenya from the 22nd Senator of Colbeck, March. Senator Colbeck, please year. resume your seat. I'm going to insist that when I call individual senators to order, they stay silent for a little while because I can't hear the answer. And I have numerous complaints from those attending remotely that with the volume in the chamber, they can't hear the answer. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. AstraZeneca was available in that community from the 22nd of March this year in line with our commitment under the national plan. Pfizer was available in that community from the 11th of June this year, Mr President. So the vaccines have been available in those communities, Mr President. Uh, as we said we would do and we continue to ramp up the vaccination rollout, Mr President, and as the circumstances, and as the circumstances in those communities have changed, Mr President, we have added additional support. We have the Royal Flying Doctor Service out there working with us. We have the Defence Force working out there, uh, providing additional vaccination clinics, Mr. President. So we have continued to support those communities, and we will continue to do so. Order, Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Tragically, it was reported yesterday that a man in Dubbo was the first Indigenous person to die from COVID in Australia. Health authorities said he wasn't vaccinated. He should have been vaccinated months ago. How has the Morrison-Joyce government failed so badly to protect vulnerable First Nation people from COVID? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, and as uh, Senator Birmingham indicated earlier in the day, uh, the vaccination rates uh, we're quite a have, we're, have acknowledged that the vaccination rates um, need to increase, Mr President, as of today. Uh, 216,724 Indigenous peoples, or 30 per cent, 37 per cent have had their first dose. 20.5 per cent, or 118,886, have had their second, Mr President. The numbers aren't high enough. We need to continue to work on this. And we've done that through a number of programs, Mr President. We have sought out uh, influences to support vaccination into those communities. Unfortunately, Mr President, there have been some very unfortunate, very unfortunate, but influential voices who have been anti-vaccine in some of those communities. We have to turn those attitudes around, and we will continue to do that in support of getting Senator particularly Indigenous Australians vaccinated, but all Order. vaccinations, because we know that that's our path Order. through the, through the pandemic. Sen Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Can the minister update the Senate on the National Summit on Women's Safety and how the summit will be delivered in light of the current COVID-19 restrictions? The Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank Senator Chandler for her question. Well, the National Summit on Women's Safety is an absolutely critical step in the development of the next national plan to end violence against women and their children. It will be an ambitious blueprint to stop the scourge that is family, domestic and sexual violence in Australia. The plan will respond to urgent new issues that we are facing today and build a base for emerging and evolving issues into the future. I'm pleased to advise the Senate that the summit will be held next Monday and Tuesday, the 6th and 7th of September, in virtual format. Through an online platform, it will bring together experts, survivors, advocates and service providers from locations all around Australia. Panels and presentations will be live streamed uh, to enable uh, Australians to engage in this very important milestone in our work towards developing the next national plan. 
The summit will uh, cover a very, very broad range of issues, uh, including things such as economic security and financial independence, e-safety, perpetrator interventions and responding to sexual violence, to name but a few. It's the culmination of extensive consultations and will allow a diverse range of delegates to build a foundation in shaping our next national plan. Importantly, the summit is an opportunity to put a spotlight on our shared commitment to create a future where women and children live free from violence. We are absolutely committed to work towards a towards zero target to ensure all Australians are safe in their home, at work and safe in our communities. The live stream will be available to watch on the 6th and 7th of September via womenssafetysummit.com.au. I encourage absolutely everybody who wants to have their say on the next national plan to engage with this very, very important milestone. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how will you be engaging with people across the sector throughout the summit? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, hearing from the diverse groups in our community is absolutely crucial to ensure our next national plan is the best possible plan it can be. And that's why our consultation process is extensive and involves hearing from victim survivors, from advocates, service providers and other experts in this field. For maximum reach, we are using a, a range of medium, including public survey, the recent parliamentary inquiry, targeted workshops and interviews with key stakeholders through the up-and-coming National uh, Summit for Women's Safety. Through the summit, panels uh, are being held to bring together a cross-section of views from survivors, the service sector, academics and other experts to discuss existing issues and to delve into the new and emerging issues that we are already starting to see. So to ensure that all Australians are able to contribute to this important national conversation, consultations have been extended through a new survey available to all members of the public and will be available on DSS Engage until the 15th of September. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How else is the Liberal and Nationals government continuing to work towards the commitment to end violence against women and their children in the transition to the next national plan to reduce violence against women and their children? Senator Rustin. Well, this week I announced that we're committing $4.2 million to a trial and new domestic violence deterrence program as part of our commitment to end violence against women and their children, which is part of the government's $1.1 billion women's safety package. Early interventions are absolutely essential if we are to reduce violence, and that's why perpetrator programs are such an important part of our response. It is absolutely unacceptable that in Australia around 50 per cent of perpetrators will commit a further domestic violence offence within four years of their initial offence. The Coordinated Enforcement and Support to Eliminate Domestic Violence Program aims to deter perpetrators from reoffending through overt monitoring and clear consequences for re repeat offending behaviours. The program will be delivered by the Australian Institute of Criminology, working in close contact with the state and territory police forces. This program has been highly successful in the US by holding offenders to account for their behaviour. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Senator, rapid antigen testing kits for COVID-19 are going to be Sorry, effective. Senator like Lambie, I'll, I'll let me start the clock again, but you, we just, you just dropped out a bit after I got the direction to Senator Colbeck. Could you start the question again, please? Uh, OK, Mr President, can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Thank you. Um, Senator Colbeck, rapid antigen testing kits for COVID-19 are going to be a fact of life for many of us in the next stage of this pandemic. From Monday, unvaccinated people in Sydney will need to take them before they can go to work. I reckon a lot of us will be going the same way eventually. The tests aren't as accurate as lab tests, but they give you a quick answer in 20 minutes and they're just a swab up the nose. Easy enough to do on your own. Senator, does your government understand how important rapid tests will be for us in the next few months? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Lambie, for the question. Um, I think it's an important one. Uh, Mr. President, there are, I think, over 20 different types of rapid antigen tests that are approved for use in Australia through the Therapeutic Goods Administration. 
Uh, and I know that uh, uh, a lot of businesses are already looking at their utilisation as a part of the way that they manage uh, and protect themselves and their workforce from COVID-19 as we go forward. As you might have heard, uh, earlier in question time today, I indicated that we uh, have commenced a process of rolling out rapid antigen tests uh, from the national stockpile to aged care providers in um, metropolitan Sydney and also in regional areas of New South Wales where COVID is uh, a concern because it is uh, a simple way to get some indication in short time frame of whether or not uh, there is um, a, a worker uh, who might have uh, an infection of COVID-19, Mr President. Senator Lambie, you're right when you mention in your question uh, that they don't have the same efficacy as a, um, uh, one of the standard tests that's being used, the PCR test that's being utilised uh, more broadly across the community, uh, but I think they can and will play a role in the management of COVID-19. That's why we're rolling them out through uh, residential aged care, because you can get an indication of somebody who might be carrying the virus before they go to work, and that's why business and industry are utilising them uh, already, Mr President. Uh, well, uh, and so even someone who's vaccinated can be transmitting the virus and carrying the virus, and so these provide an additional layer of protection uh, to us all as part of our management of COVID-19. Uh, so as I said, there are over 20 different types of uh, uh, rapid antigen tests that are currently Order. approved Senator with very good time guidelines the on the TGA website. Expired. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Senator, in the United Kingdom, you can pick up a rapid test for free from any pharmacy. You can take it home and get an answer in 20 minutes. But for some reason in Australia, we can only do the test if we're supervised by a trained health official and we have to pay for it ourselves. Is there a reason that the coalition doesn't trust Australians to chuck a swab up our nose? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and again, it's an important question. Uh, because one of the things that's a very important part of our overall management of COVID-19 is our test, track and trace capabilities. Our test, track and trace capabilities, Mr President. Uh, we saw that in Victoria last year, how important it was. Uh, we see what's happening in other jurisdictions around the country now where significant effort is being undertaken by states and territories across the country in their testing regimes, their tracking and tracing, and then isolation of the virus. So they all play a very important part in that process. You Order. made the point yourself, Mr. Uh, Senator Lambie, when you talked about the fact that these tests aren't as accurate as the PCR tests that we're using in that broader process. So we support the use of these tests under the conditions of approval by the Therapeutic Goods Administration, Mr. President, supported by the backup of a PCR test if there's an indicator, Mr President, which is very important. Order. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Senator, you and I uh, know that I don't always agree with big business lobbyists, but today in his Willix, the head of the Australian Industry Group called on the government to pay for rapid tests when their government mandated, like in New South Wales. He says that forcing employers to pay for tests so they can get their workers on site is putting a tax on jobs. I reckon he's right. Why are we so far behind once again? And when will free rapid tests be available for every worker who needs one? Senator Colbeck. Uh, well, Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Lambie. Um, and in, in high-risk occupations, Mr. President, in high-risk areas, we're actually doing that. As I've indicated, we are supporting res residential aged care providers in New South Wales with the provision of rapid antigen tests uh, into those facilities, and over 120 facilities have already received tests and have started the process, Mr. President. So, in the circumstances where it is warranted, Mr. President, we're already uh, providing that level of support, which I think is important, and we'll continue to do that. An extra layer of protection for those businesses where we're looking after our most vulnerable, Mr. President. Uh, uh, I saw in, uh, in Tokyo over 600,000 tests of rapid antigen type. Uh, applied through the Olympic Games to support the running of the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, Mr. President. So they can form an important part of the overall management 
uh, and uh, uh, testing regime that occurs in the country, Mr. President, but they need to be supported by the efficacy of a PCR test. Order. Senator McCarthy. Sorry, we're not hearing you, Senator McCarthy. I know I've got a reserve here for you. I'll give you another chance. Yes, thank Thanks. you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. I referred to reports the First Nations woman was turned away with COVID-19 with breathing difficulties from Wilkanga Medical Service last week. Barkindji woman Monica Kerwin-Wyman said the woman was left outside like a dog and has pleaded, and I quote, somebody, anybody, get this out there. This is what's going on in Wilkanga and I'm crying, I'm tired and nobody's helping us. Minister, why has the Morrison government abandoned First Nations people in Wilkanga? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Mr President, I would be very concerned if any person, any Australian was Order turned away. Senator what? was turned away from a health service when they were in need. That should not be occurring. Simply should not happen, Mr President. Uh, I don't accept uh, Senator McCarthy's characterisation that we have in any way abandoned Order. Indigenous Australians, Mr President. Uh, we, we, established, we established very early on in the pandemic, in fact in March, beginning of March last year, uh, a national strategy, national strategy uh, an advisory group on COVID-19 back on the 5th of March in 2020, Mr President. Uh, there was a national Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander management plan for novel, novel coronavirus approved uh, on the 26th of March last year, Mr President, and the implementation of that plan um, for the vaccine program uh, and Torres Strait Islander people was finalised on the 9th of March this year, Mr President. So we have prioritised Australian, Indigenous Australians as a part of the program. We have supplied vaccines, as I have already indicated, Order. to the chamber today, Mr President. Uh, the circumstances of the Indigenous woman that's been described by Senator McCarthy should not have happened. Australians should be able to access health services. Order. They should be able to access health services when they need them, Mr President. They Mr President, uh, we will continue the work that we are doing with the RFDS, the Defence Force, the Archos, all the Indigenous health services around the country who are supporting their own people in managing the pandemic, through, whether it be through providing vaccines, uh, as many of them are doing, Mr President, or providing health services, uh, and we will continue to support them in doing that. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. The CEO of the Northern Territory Aboriginal Medical Services, John Patterson, has warned, and I quote, the targets suggested of 70 or 80 per cent vaccination are totally fraudulent if applied to remote Australia. They would totally fail our people. How many First Nations Australians, Minister, will be fully vaccinated when Australia reaches the 70 and 80 per cent targets for Australians aged over 16? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I would hope that, all, uh, that the uh, indigenous, the Order. indigenous vaccination rate, I would hope that the indigenous vac vaccination rate, is lifted to at least match, but if not better, uh, the vaccination rate for the rest of the population, Mr. President. That's what that's what Order. we would like to see, Mr. President. I have acknowledged here today, Mr. President. I have already acknowledged Order. here in the chamber today uh, that uh, the vaccination numbers are not high enough. We can need to continue to work, to lift those numbers, working with the Indigenous communities, with the First Nations people, with influences of those First Nations people to encourage Indigenous Australians to take up a vaccine, Mr order. President. Senator Colbeck, I have Senator Keneally on a point of order. Senator Keneally. It is a point of relevance. It was a very um, tightly worded question, how many First Nations Australians will be fully vaccinated when we hit 70 80 per cent? I that, that, that question, to Senator Keneally, you are, you, are, you, are, you are going beyond an issue of direct relevance and asking me to instruct the minister how to answer a question. When he's talking about this subject material, he is being very rele directly relevant to a very specific question. Senator Colbeck to continue. And Mr President, I have actually addressed specifically the matter of the question, Mr President, 
And so Senator Keneally might like to just interrupt question time as many times as you possibly can, Mr President. Uh, and our objective is to have uh, vaccination rates equally high across the country, across all communities, because it's important and it's our path through the pandemic. Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. Ms Kerwin Wyman also warned, and I quote, they don't have a COVID plan here, they don't have ventilators, they don't have anything, and I think they've just got body bags. Minister, given Mr Morrison has failed to deliver on his promise to vaccinate 1B priority groups by winter, does the Morrison-Joyce government regret Mr Morrison declaring the vaccine rollout is not a race? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I think the statement made uh, by that community representative is a very unfortunate one because very early in the pandemic, the thing that this government did and the, and the work that we did, particularly with the states and territories, and can I say I commend the work of the Northern Territory Government and the relationship that we have with the Northern Territory Government in relation to uh, providing uh, health services out through to, to communities, um, uh, uh, Mr President, and, and across the country, Mr President. Uh, is, is extremely important. Uh, and, and we have provided significant assets and resources, including ventilators, to ensure that they were available in the circumstance that they were needed. In fact, we, we, we were able to gather so many ventilators that, we've, ventilators that we've actually been able to provide them to some of our regional neighbours who didn't have them, Mr President. So I reject the premise that we haven't worked to put the systems in place and the relationships in place to support Order, Australians Senator through the Colbeck. health system. Senator Small. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Unlike the Labor Party, which included a retiree tax in its policy platform taken to the last election as just one part of $387 billion in taxes, can the Minister advise the Senate on the headline results from APRA's release today of the very first annual superannuation fund performance test and how this forms just part of the Morrison government's plan to not only protect but to enhance uh, the Australians' uh, uh, retirement incomes into the future. Senator Keneally and Watt, during the question, please. The Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Small for his question, and a very important question it is too. In fact, it's a very important day today for all superannuation members out there and Australia's future retirees, because today the outcomes of the first annual performance test for My Super Products has been published on the Your Super Comparison tool on the ATO's website. Now, this performance test reveals that $56.2 billion of Australians' retirement funds is in fact invested in underperforming products. And these products are held in almost 1.1 million separate accounts. The test assessed the performance of over 80 My Super products and found that 13 of these products have underperformed. And as we predicted, it is a mixture of retail, industry, and corporate funds that have underperformed. Mr. President, the Morrison government is hauling performance out of the darkness and into the light, into the bright sunlight of accountability. And it will be very uncomfortable for some of those funds. But it is so important, and let me explain to you why. Because, Mr. President, the Australian superannuation industry has now reached the dizzying heights of $3.3 trillion. Now that, to put it into context, is bigger than GDP. Order. It is bigger than the ASX and it has, doubled. it has doubled in size since the coalition came to government. Senator Watt. Reports of superannuation's death have been greatly exaggerated by those opposite. Back when we came to government, we inherited a system that was riddled with flaws. That meant that super wasn't delivering on its promise to the 16 million Australian workers and retirees who rely upon it. Since then, the Morrison government has been chipping away at those inefficiencies. We are eliminating unintended multiple accounts that you allowed to proliferate. We're reuniting lost and inactive and low balance accounts with their rightful owners. We've banned exit fees. We've capped fees on low balances. We've removed unnecessary insurance premiums, particularly for young people that did not need them. And we've empowered all Australians to choose their own funds, something you have Order. denied them Senator for years Hume. and Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I do have a supplementary question. In light of the fact that Australian superannuation pool is now larger 
than GDP, arguably connecting Australians to their own money in superannuation, has never been more important. So how can Australians access the Your Super comparison tool? And take up. Oh, sorry. Watt. And how has the take up of the tool been since it was launched? Or, se sorry, Senator Watt, I have repeatedly asked for silence during the question. Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, at present, Australian households pay around $30 billion a year in superannuation fees. Now, to put that into context, it's actually more than the $27 billion that households spend on energy bills and the $12 billion that they spend on water bills. It's now easier than ever for Australians to ensure that they are not being ripped off by their fund with the introduction of the Your Super comparison tool. Mr. President, more than 375,000 Australians have, in fact, already accessed the Your Super comparison tool in just the two months since it was launched. And we know that many more Australians will now use that tool to compare their super fund after those performance results were released today. Finally, superannuation members can compare apples with apples. It's Order. so simple to use. Just jump on your search engine and look up super comparison tool. Click on the ATO website Senator and you will, the next thing you know is you'll be comparing funds and you can even personalise it. Your fund, your balance through the ATO portal, through Order. the MyGov Senator website. Hume, it's never been easier. Question. Answer has expired. Senator O'Neill. Senator Small, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Because the Morrison government stands for protecting, preserving and enhancing the retirement incomes of Australians, can the minister outline what the consequences will be for those funds that failed the performance test two years in a row? And what reactions has the government received from stakeholders in uh, the super sector to these important performance measures? Senator Hume. Thank you again, Mr President. And this is an extraordinarily important question because if your superannuation fund is failing, there are very serious consequences. Funds are now required to notify their members, to notify you of their underperformance on the 27th of September this year. Funds must provide members with the details of, their your, of the your super comparison tool so that members can then consider whether a different product would better suit their needs. Mr President, the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority has now also written to super Superannuation Order. funds whose products fail or marginally pass that performance test, setting out their supervisory expectations. And this will include APRA assessing the credibility of funds' plans to improve their performance and to lower their fees. Importantly, products that fail the annual performance test two years in a row will be closed to new members until their performance improves. That means they will not be allowed to take on new members who will suffer from their continual underperformance. APRA have made their position clear. Trustees of the 13 products that have Order. failed the test now Senator face Hume, an important time choice. For the answer has expired. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that further questions be now placed on notice. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Keneally. Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Senators Sheldon, O'Neill, McCarthy and myself. The situation in New South Wales today is deeply concerning. Our hospital system is groaning under the weight of the latest COVID outbreak, and there is no relief in sight. Mr Morrison had two jobs this year, roll out a vaccine and fix the leaky quarantine system, and he has monumentally failed at both, and it's Australians and their families that are left to suffer. We have seen in other countries what it looks like like when a hospital system is overwhelmed by COVID. Doctors and nurses struggle to care for the skyrocketing number of patients requiring intensive care. They're ultimately forced to choose which patients receive life-saving treatment. Effectively, they must choose between who lives and who dies. This doesn't just impact those who have COVID-19, but it affects anyone suffering from a life-threatening illness and injury as the finite resources of our health care system are stretched to the breaking point. It is a fate that is too difficult to contemplate for my home state, and yet we are seeing the telltale signs of a system on the brink of disaster. Last week, Westmead Hospital and Blacktown Hospital stopped accepting COVID patients, forcing paramedics to ramp up with patients on board. 
It's been reported that overworked Sydney ICU nurses are now sedating patients to manage what they describe as hellhole conditions. Another 1,164 cases in the state today will only add to this strain. We are 18 months into this pandemic. We are six months into this vaccine rollout, and yet it's never looked more dire, and yet never has this minister looked so out of touch. Everything, according to him, is going just fine. Patting himself on the back for failing to meet the targets they set, leaving New South Wales, leaving Indigenous people, leaving aged care workers, leaving Australians behind. Remember, this is a prime minister who claimed that the vaccine rollout wasn't a race. And look where we are now. Like as usual with Mr. Morrison, it's always somebody else's fault. Make no mistake, what we are seeing in New South Wales today is the direct result of the failures of the Morrison government. A proper hotel quarantine system would mean we didn't have leakages. But hotels are for tourists. They're not for quarantine. And under Mr. Morrison, we have seen 27 leakages, which have led to illness and death across the country. The outbreak that we are currently experiencing in New South Wales was something that Jane Halton warned the Prime Minister about last year, the transport system, a leak in the quarantine system. And by the way, the 27 leaks I'm talking about doesn't even include the Ruby Princess debacle, which we heard this week, the Inspector General of Biosecurity said was a failure of federal officials, agriculture department officials, who didn't check the traveler with illness checklists, didn't review the ship medical logs, and didn't warn New South Wales Health that COVID was rampant on the Ruby Princess, meaning they failed to stop the one boat that mattered. If we had a proper vaccine rollout, we'd have a safe and speedy rollout of jabs and arms. Remember, four million of us were supposed to be vaccinated by, the, by May. Ten million, all of us were supposed to be vaccinated <clears throat> by October. That's not going to happen. It is always too little, too late. It is vulnerable communities that are being left behind. We are now seeing doctors like Dr. P Peter Maloof in New South Wales labeling the vaccine rollout in indigenous communities a chaotic crisis. The Morrison government's response to COVID-19 must be seen as one of the most catastrophic public policy failures of any government in the history of our nation. We have New South Wales Minister Brad Hazard pointing the finger at the federal government. We have the New South Wales Deputy Premier, John Barillaro, pointing the finger at the failures of the Morrison government. The problem we have here is not that people have vaccine hesitancy, it's that we have a prime minister who has just apathy. He's too little, too late, it's always somebody else's fault, and it's the Australian people who are being left behind to suffer the consequences. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, what we have just seen from the, uh, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition in this place uh, is exactly why the Labor Party lacked the credentials to lead this country. Uh, they, this panicked pantomime that we just saw from Senator Keneally is exactly what the Australian people do not want now at a time of difficulty and crisis. This is a very difficult time for our country. It's a very difficult time for the world to be tackling a pandemic. But what people want in a pandemic is not panic, they want calm. What people need during a pandemic is not gross exaggeration. They want us to steely and stoically deal with the situation and come up with solutions. Uh, Senator Keneally and the other Labor senators today, Madam Acting T Deputy Chair, quoted from the New South Wales government extensively in their questions, but they failed to quote the Premier on the very topic that Senator Keneally just spent her time talking about. She is in this place spreading panic through our land that somehow our hospitals within hours, within days, may be completely overcrowded and have no ability to take people. That is completely untrue. 
and if she was seriously looking at the statements from the New South Wales government, she would know it is untrue, but she has been cherry-picking those statements for political interests rather than providing the professional, calm leadership that is required at a time like this. Um, the Premier of New South Wales, Premier Berejiklian, was quoted, quoted just the other day. Uh, this, was, this was an article from just four days ago that uh, Premier Berejiklian said that we have been ready for additional ICU patients for a long time. We have always had these contingency plans, but what is confronting for us is when you have a network that has great staff is seeing more patients. It does stretch things and it does mean things are done differently. That's exactly what the Australian people need. They need that calm leadership that we will respond to this, we will, we will tackle it. And I don't know if Senator Keneally has spoken to her own local health authorities. I've been in constant contact with mine in central Queensland from the start of this pandemic, and I know that, that very early on they expanded their ICU capabilities. They've always had plans in place to do that. And in fact, there was a detailed paper um, published in the Medical Journal of Australia last year which showed the ability of our great health system to respond, our fantastic health system. And that paper, uh, a, a variety of professionals uh, went across the country and uh, I believe they spoke to 191 different ICU units across Australia. They had, at the start of the pandemic, we had 2,378 intensive care beds. What this study found was that very quickly we could add another 4,258 intensive care beds if required, if we had to, because we have a great health system full of great health professionals. And I think Senator Keneally does our health professionals a great disservice when she seems to question their ability to respond. I have great faith in them. And what we need to focus on now is, is, is coming up with the solutions to support our health professionals, to support Australians in this pandemic, not unnecessarily panic everybody throughout the land and, and contribute or further contribute to the stress and strain that is on many Australians, especially those going through lockdown right now. We would, of course, all love to return to a place where we had zero COVID cases. It was wonderful. It was great. But we do live in the real world here. And it seems to me that Senator Keneally and her colleagues on the Labor side want to be the government of Disneyland, not the government of Australia. The only place where zero COVID cases will exist now is in a fantasy land, in a Disneyland. We are not going back to that state of affairs. That is the reality. In fact, even the Victorian Premier today has recognised that when he said that he will look at easing restrictions even before, before Victoria gets back to zero cases. That he will in the next few days apparently outline a, a, a st some steps where even, even with positive cases where restrictions will be eased. That is a sensible approach. But the Labor Party here are playing catch-up. They are playing catch-up. They are holding on to a fantasy that can no longer, we can no longer uh, deliver. And what our job should be as leaders, as people in this country in positions of authority, our, our job should be to level with the Australian people, to tell them the truth, uh, not to spread panic and fairy tales that will never be able to be implemented. This government is, along with the state and territory governments, is responding professionally to this crisis. We need to have a map out of this so we can let people out of their homes, let people get back to work and deal with this pandemic in the best way we can with a wonderful, the wonderful health system we have in this nation. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator McAllister. Thanks, Deputy President. Well, when Mr Morrison decided to take a gamble on hotel quarantine and vaccines last year, he set in chain a series of events that led us to exactly where we are today. And it didn't have to be this way. A Prime Minister who was more interested in leading rather than reducing vectors of political exposure would have actually fixed our quarantine system, would have taken responsibility for securing more types and greater numbers of vaccines. Instead, we have a Prime Minister who found time to research his family tree during a trip overseas while thousands of Australians remain stranded with no way home. And the consequences of Mr Morrison's decisions are becoming clearer by the day. In the last 48 hours, we have had significant numbers of health personnel speak out, 
despite the fact that their employment contracts actually make this kind of personally risky for them. They choose to speak out about the pressures they are under and about their fears for the health system. These are people on the front line of the pandemic, and the government should listen to them. Senator Canavan is right. A government should level with its people. Nothing about the current approach suggests to me that the government is levelling with its people because it's not willing to engage with the questions that are being raised from the very people whose daily responsibility is to protect and to care for sick people in New South Wales. Nurses, paramedics and doctors, they are blowing the whistle on the challenges ahead. And I'll quote a Sydney nurse who said this, we are exhausted. Last night was brutal. We literally hit capacity just holding on the patients are air hungry, starving for breath. We simply don't have enough of us. We are on the edge now. We have been trying to warn the government for a year. Now, the union that represents these workers has said it's becoming increasingly concerned that Australia's public hospitals will not be able to cope with the growing demand if we allow COVID to take hold before we're truly prepared. And that's the key, isn't it? Because yes, we want to get out of lockdown, but it needs to be safe. And a safe emergence from this pandemic requires careful planning and consideration. Yesterday, we heard of the tragic news of the first Indigenous COVID death in Australia, a 50-year-old man, a much-loved granduncle who got to see his grandchild just once. He wasn't vaccinated. And Aboriginal health services workers, advocates, community members have warned the government for months and months that this was a possibility, but these warnings have been ignored. The New South Wales Deputy Premier, Mr Barillaro, has said, and I quote, we know that the federal government's vaccination program at the start of the year identified Indigenous communities as part of the 1A rollout and it hasn't occurred. And that's something they lost attention of and we know earlier in the year the rollout wasn't anywhere near where it needed to be. PM promised. He promised that First Nations communities would be fully vaccinated by winter. But the reality is, is that just 8% of First Nations people in Western New South Wales are fully vaccinated. It's time to take responsibility for that and to develop a plan to remedy it. Because the government has bungled this vaccination rollout. We are a very long way away from the 70% threshold or the 80% threshold. Yes. People are looking for a safe pathway to resume something like normal life. People are desperate for it. But it all depends on having a serious plan to manage the pandemic. And frankly, Mr Morrison has bungled every opportunity presented to him to lead through this pandemic. He stood by while the crisis raged through nursing homes in Victoria a sector that is regulated, controlled by the Commonwealth, refusing to take responsibility, shunting responsibility onto the state government. He failed to procure enough vaccines and a diverse range of contracts, and it left the Australian community dangerously exposed to Delta. Less than a quarter of Australians fully vaccinated when the second wave brutally started sweeping through our communities. And I see absolutely no sign that he's now ready to roll up his sleeves and tackle this next crisis. What he would prefer, of course, as always, is a political approach. Just pick fights with state premiers, distract, divert, wait till the news cycle moves on. Well, a pandemic doesn't move on. A pandemic doesn't move on. And real leaders do offer calm, considered leadership. It involves talking to people, not harassing them and nitpicking. It involves actually engaging the state premiers to make this, pan to make this federation pandemic Thank ready. You. Senator McAllister, your time has expired. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Madam Deputy Principal. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to rise today to speak to this particular issue. Um, oh, Act Acting Deputy President, sorry, uh, to speak to this issue. And in particular, uh, I'd like to uh, just remind Senator Keneally of the boats, because when the Labor Party was last in power, over 1,200 people died at sea in the boats by something that was totally brought on by the Labor Party. Now compare that to the number of people who died with COVID, and that is only just past 1,000, and, and a lot of those had comorbidities. Uh, and I can assure you that the Morrison government didn't design COVID. Unlike the boat people, unlike the boat crisis that was designed by the Labor Party, uh, and it was something that was totally self-inflicted, so it's a bit rich for them to come in here and play games and accuse the Morrison government 
of causing deaths, which had, you know, is basically was basically out of their control. They, the Morrison government, of Australia, has got one of the lowest COVID uh, deaths in in the world, and we've actually got one of the lowest case uh, fatality rates in the world. And it's worth noting that this year we've had less than 100 COVID deaths out of over 20,000 cases. That is a case fatality rate of 0.04 per cent, or four people, less than four people out of every 1,000 cases. Compare that to the number of deaths in 2019. Australia had 170,000 deaths out of 25 million people. That was a, a death rate of seven people out of 1,000. So the COVID fatality rate is just around half of the overall fatality rate. Now let's talk about the vaccine rollout. We've basically now got 86% of over 70-year-olds uh, first dosed and over 63% of over 70-year-olds second dosed. And I get a little bit sick and tired of hearing the Labor Party talk about this AstraZeneca Pfizer uh, as though it's a competition. I mean, the fact of the matter is this, is that last August, when, and when Labor loved to claim that we could have bought 40 million doses, the fact is, is that the Pfizer vaccine hadn't even been approved for safety and hadn't even been proved that it actually worked. It's a completely new technology. Interestingly enough, the World Health Organisation came out in September last year and said that it was going to take another nine months, or it wouldn't be until mid-2021, uh, until such time as the Pfizer vaccine was going to be ready. Another point to note is that the Pfizer vaccine had to be refrigerated and stored at negative 70 degrees. Now, the Morrison coalition government had to make a decision back then. They went to, with the uh, AstraZeneca uh, vaccine uh, as its main supplier because they could get it produced here in Australia. And they could get it produced here in Australia by none other than CSL. Now, to remind people about the history of CSL, that used to be government owned. It was actually set up in 1917 so that Australia, by the government, so that Australia would have its own, wait for it, vaccine supplies. And what happened was that the Labor Party sold CSL, and in that time since, it's now got into blood transfusion and a lot of other products, uh, but its main core business, vaccine production, has gone by the wayside. So for Labor to come in here and claim that, oh, we haven't got enough vaccines, they ought to look in the mirror, because the damage was done, that, that was caused right back in 1992 by a bloke by the name of Paul Keating and one of his great advisors, Bill Botel, he's out there running around being an expert on everything, and yet he was one of the advisors to Keating that allowed CSL to be sold. I mean, the hypocrisy is astounding. And it should also be noted that the US hasn't, didn't even export Pfizer. The first country it exported Pfizer to was Mexico on the 29th of April. On the 29th of April. So the USA is, is exporting very few vac uh, Pfizer vaccines, and that seems to be overlooked in all of this, is that it's not that easy to just go and conjure, uh, you know, 50 odd million uh, Pfizer vaccines at the drop of a hat, keep them stored uh, at negative 70 degrees and get them rolled out. But can I say that we, the, the vaccination program is well and truly on its way, and it hasn't been helped, of course, by you know, Queensland's chief health officer, who's been there under a Labor government, who's been basically talking people out of getting the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. Uh, having All the while, while she's saying this, she's failed to disclose that her own husband used to work and consult to Pfizer. Now, if that's not a conflict of interest, I don't know what is. But can I say that that type of behaviour, while we're trying to encourage vaccine rollouts, hasn't helped anyone. So it's about time Labor got on board and started to work for the interests of the Australian people rather than whinging and wailing. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Your time has expired. Senator Sheldon. Well, that was quite mind-boggling. Um, you know, quite clearly, when we first got into this vaccines, we decided there was a clear indication there was a necessity to have a whole series of vaccines purchased on order so that those that failed, those that didn't follow through, that we'd have enough for the Australian community. And of course, the time has proven it. Pfizer told them, epidemiologists told the government, uh, Pfizer told the government in, in direct conversations and indirect conversations. And yet the government still has failed to turn around and take responsibility for its mistake. And not, not because we're looking back, I'm looking backwards. I'm looking forwards. 
if they won't take account for what they're doing wrong right now, how can people have the confidence necessary of this being appropriately dealt with in the future? Now, today we have another 1,164 new local COVID-19 cases here in New South Wales. We have 871 in hospital and 143 in intensive care. People are suffering from the mental toll of months of lockdown and small businesses are suffering dire economic hardship. It's important to remember that the reason we are in this situation is because the Prime Minister failed in his two most important jobs, to get the vaccine rollout right and to get a dedicated quarantine system up and running. And of course, we saw with the Bondi outbreak with the limo driver driving international flight crew that there was not appropriate safeguards at our border. That is a federal government responsibility. And yet we hear repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly from the government that they should not be held to account for the mistakes and the failings that they have made and the ones they continue to make. Now, the health system is already a breaking point before the Prime Minister's national plan, which would now, based on Doherty modelling, will put tens of thousands more Australians in hospital. Without any plan for how our medical system can handle that pressure, any serious plan about a way of moving forward, this rollout is quite clearly a failure. And now the failure and the government needs to take responsibility. Not enough Pfizer, delays, New South Wales Health Minister making it clear and blowing the whistle on the silence of the federal government and their incompetence about Pfizer. And of course, the moment of truth, respond to a quote from an experienced respiratory physician at Western Sydney to Senator Colbeck. Now, we're, and I'll, I'll repeat this because you know, I'm hoping that, uh, that those listening to the Senate will just be so outraged as I am that this question was not answered. With the coming deluge of cases, it is possible ambulances will not reach people suffering heart attacks or strokes as quickly as they should, said a Western Sydney doctor. And quite clearly, the government needs to take responsibility and be able to deal appropriately and fitting and in a fit way the sorts of pressures that are applying at the moment on our health system. Now, you know, of course, you don't you have to sort of um, have too much of an imagination because you've got the government turning around saying it's not a race. You don't have too much imagination that we're in a crisis, but the government says it's not a race. You can't have too much imagination about the fact that we've got so many people that are now suffering from COVID and the effect on business. But of course, it wasn't a race. Now, this government continues to try to distract people, distracting them by saying the failure is the opposition. This is just ironic. Failure is the opposition by raising the government's mistruths and failures. That is absolutely ludicrous. Take responsibility. I know the Prime Minister won't do it. I'd say this to the ministers, take responsibility and to the government. New South Wales, of course, along with those pressures on services, we've seen staff shortages, hospitals reaching out to ICU capacity, reaching at ICU capacity, an increased sedation of ICU patients in order to manage the burgeoning work life in the New South Wales COVID system. In 60,000 aged care workers are still not vaccinated. Don't be alarmed. Well, I wish you were more alarmed. I wish you actually thought it was a race. It is a race to vaccinate the dead, by the deadline 60,000 aged care workers. I think it's appropriately said by Health uh, Services Union National President Jared Hayes, said the Aged Care Royal Commission found in March the sector was facing a staffing crisis that risked being Order. exasperated Senator by the pandemic. Sheldon. Um, the question is the motion moved by Senator Keneally be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I rise to take note of the answer by Senator Birmingham to uh, Senator Thorpe's question on vaccination rates for First Nations peoples, but particularly focused on Wilcannia in Western New South Wales. And the minister would not answer the question, which was, when will all First Nations peoples be vaccinated. When? 
and he danced around and he danced around, but he wouldn't say because he can't say because the rollout for First Nations communities has been dismal. It is unconscionable. First Nations peoples were either in phase 1A or phase 1B, supposed to have been vaccinated by now. And yet here we see a man in Wilcannia passing away due to COVID, a First Nations man passing away. When the government knew if COVID got into First Nations communities, it would have a devastating impact. In fact, if you look at the timeline, in March last year, Miramar, Aboriginal Health Corporation wrote to the Morrison government warning about COVID-19 outbreaks in Western New South Wales. In July this year, Nacho was excluded from the National COVID-19 Vaccination Task Force meeting. How did that happen? When everybody in Australia knows that First Nations communities are, such a, are at such significant risk. How did it happen? We've had elders calling for vaccine supplies. Nurse, this is in August 18, for nurses to support Aboriginal medical services and appropriate accommodation so people could quarantine. And what does the government do? Sends in the army and the police. In the letter that was written from the Maramar, from the Maramar Aboriginal Health Corporation, they warned about the great risk because of overcrowded housing, food insecurity, highly mobile population, low health literacy and issues around poorer health and chronic diseases. All the things the government, I'm sure, knew about it, but they reminded the government about it to put it high on the agenda. And what do we see now? The situation, the disaster that's happening in Western New South Wales. It is unconscionable that the Prime Minister has overseen this happening and they override First Nations wishes. We should have First Nations peoples making these decisions. Nacho is very clear in providing the advice. The Aboriginal health organisations are very clear that they need to be in the driving seat here because First Nations peoples have and must have self-determination and control over this program. I'm told that First Nations peoples are laughing at the messaging. It is so poor. Well, you know how you make sure you get it right? Is you put it in the hands of First Nations organisations. It's not as if they haven't got their own media hubs. Many communities, in fact, have their own media hubs and they know how to communicate to their own community. Get, enable them to do it. Enable communities to take control of the decision making. But what have they done? Excluded, excluded Nacho from crucial meetings. And what targets are they going back to Senator Birmingham's non-answer on targets? Or when, when will we see all First Nations peoples vaccinated? Now, Nacho's calling for 100 per cent vaccination of First Nations peoples, or, or as close as you can, you can get, acknowledging that some people can't, due to health reasons, have a vaccination. But we need to make sure we're aiming for 100 per cent. When will we see that happen? This government, the minister representing the Prime Minister, could not answer that question. When? We know. We know that First Nations people are so at risk. So when, so when Maramara wrote to the government, they suggested accommodations such as motels and caravan parks could be used for quarantining. They saw the need for this. They saw in March last year the urgent need for these sorts of things to take place, knowing very well that we needed to make sure that there were safe places for people to go because of the overcrowding. And I won't take up the rest of the time talking about the appalling state of housing for First Nations peoples because Australia knows that. We also need to, so they also suggested ways to safeguard against food shortages, and we're hearing about that. We're hearing that people can't go out and make sure that they're being able to be adequately uh, fed. We now see Will Kenya has the highest transmission rate in New South Wales. Shame on the New South Wales government and shame on the Morrison government that it's got to this point. They knew this could happen and unfortunately it is now. It's a travesty that this is occurring to First Nations communities and to Will Kenya. The question is the motion moved by Senator C would be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given?